Blog Talk Radio. another exciting program of Dr. Mary Lee Live coming from the East Coast out of Washington, D.C. And I'm Dr. Tatum from Bakersfield, California. And our executive producer is James Cannon, the uh, father of entertainer Nick Cannon. Nick Cannon is the ambassador there of the Incredible 400. Dr. Mary Lee Live has an exciting lineup today. We have a a young lady by the name of Arlena Waller, which is out of Bakersfield also. She's going to be talking about uh, She Power. She is a global ambassador empowering over 1 million women plus uh, across the nation and the world. So before we get to Dr. Mary Lee to introduce our guest, Arlena Waller, we're going to introduce uh, Mr. Michael Tynes. Uh, Mr. Tynes, are you with us? 
I am. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you great, sir. So you, uh, the ball is in your court, court, sir. Yeah, appreciate that. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Tatum, for that introduction. Um, as uh, Mr. Tatum said, tonight we're going to be featuring, uh, hopefully, a, a female empowerment-centered discussion with an um, uh, excellent speaker we have joining us, Ms. Waller. Um, as Mr. Tatum said as well, my name is Michael. I personally operate as an advocate for global African independence and empowerment. I speak on African affairs and African people to help to bring about the global independence of our people, educate our people in the, in the diaspora whenever I can. Um, before we get directly into the topic, uh, I want to bring in Dr. Lee to make sure that we have our, all of our uh, opening remarks taken care of. So, Dr. Lee, are you there? Yes, I am. Thank you so very much. And uh, again, welcome to all of you. So much appreciate it. Uh, that you're joining us tonight, and um, we, we've got a great show lined up. We're um, talking with Arlena Wallace. She is the uh, global ambassador for She Power, and uh, it's uh, a mission to empower one million women and girls to own their own She Power without any apology at all. Uh, I don't know, if Dr. Cannon, are you here tonight? Yes, yes, ma'am, I'm here. I'm on a different number, but I'm here. You got me open. Okay, very good. So I want to pass it on to you before we get started. Well, this is going to be an interesting conversation, y'all. I really appreciate everybody, Dr. Lee, uh, Michael, uh, Dr. Tatum, and the team, to bring on a conversation as we're talking about 400 years of greatness 400 years of womenhood, 400 years of mama, 400 years of grandmama, 400 years of powerful, powerful women in this country. Where would we be without a mama and our mothers and our sisters to be able to help guide and structure uh, our lives as men? Would we give homage to any woman that wants to uplift womanhood and, and bring womanhood to the forefront, particularly Afro-American women. So when you say she power, my sister, we definitely welcome you to the table. But then I, I don't want to get you mixed up with the feminists, those that want to bash men and bash black men and say that black men aren't this and never can be and women can do without men because we, you really can't build a family a great family without a man somewhere and without a father there. So we appreciate the building up of the woman, but I hope we're also going to have the conversation and the clarity on where we stand on the strength of men in the in the lives of those powerful women that you are powerful empowering. My sister, we appreciate you. Welcome you to the show tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tatum, Dr. Cannon, Michael. I just uh, just appreciate you. Just appreciate you so much. I want our listening audience to know that you are so very welcome, and we are grateful for you and appreciate you. Without you, we wouldn't have a show. So, And I'm so happy that you, you feel that this show is worth so many of you have been here the duration from our very first show and over a year ago now. And uh, I think we're up to about 70 shows, something like that, already. And some of you have not missed a show, not even a one. If you weren't here, you, you did go back and you listened to it. We're just thankful that we're, we're talking and we're doing something that is helping you out there that's worth your keep coming back and coming back and coming back. So we do appreciate that. want to ask you, this is a talk show, and we're just sitting in the living room. We're just having a good conversation. Um, so feel free. Tap one on your telephone. And uh, for a comment or a question, we will open up your line and let you know that you're uh, on the floor. So... Uh, we're without any further ado. We want to turn to Arlena Waller. It's um, it's your show, and you can start where you'd like to start at, 
or but I, I am anxious to know, you know, a, a little more about your organization, She Power, and and how you got started, and and, and just you know what your purpose purpose is, and uh, how you have moved forward to be as successful as you are. I know that's a lot of questions, but. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for joining well, us. Thank you so much, Dr. Lee, uh, for the uh, invitation. I truly appreciate it, and everyone who's on the uh, the call. I have had the privilege of listening to your shows, and it is uh, it is really an opportunity for us to think in ways that we traditionally don't think and to really learn uh, things that we need to know. So I, I, I'm honored to be a guest on this show tonight. Um, she Power Leadership Academy is a girls-only leadership academy. Our intent is to build, empower, and inspire disruptive girl leaders who go into the world and make wrongs right, to be a voice for the voiceless, and to be strength for the weak, um, who will unapologetically own their she power, sometimes undoing systems that may require you to go into that space and just explode because what we've learned is in spaces that we're typically not invited in, uh, we have to sometimes um, approach those opportunities not in traditional ways for change. And so not only do we uh, work to empower and build these girls, but to be examples of what that's like uh, to be that exact uh, thing. So that's really what we do at She Power Leadership Academy, we do that through mentorship, personal development, and diverse leadership opportunities. We really work to meet the young ladies where they are and not have a frame that they have to fit in, but to really color outside the lines, to build them to be uh, all that God has called them to be. And so you there, you guide, or as you mentor, and um, as you mentor or these uh, girls, you're teaching them to be strong in who they are and 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 develop the, the strength that that they have within. It's, well, it's absolutely. Kind of like, mm-hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Eighty-five percent of the girls in our program are on a full or partial scholarship, so we intentionally um, we intentionally look to engage with girls that are often forgotten uh, by our system structure, or who are told lies, or who are consistently hearing false narratives about who they are. I had an example the other day where. Uh, I'm a real passionate person, and Dr. Tatum knows this. He's in Bakersfield with me. And um, I believe that um, our truth should be heard, and I believe that wrongs should be brought with receipts and data. And so I, I was, I, you know, there's a trigger word a lot of times for, for black women when you hear your passion comes off as anger, right? We're the only group of women who are not allowed to be passionate um, without it being labeled. And that was a super trigger word for me when that person said that to me. And uh, I continued to have a conversation around that. And that person said, why are you attacking me? And I had to step back because these are what our girls hear. They're not, they are not allowed to be completely who they are in public. And they're often silenced by the false narratives that they hear. And so um, that was, really interesting because, you know, not only with young girls, but we work with millennials and we hear this and that's, that's key words for shut up. And so we really want to address that. What is the word again? Excuse me. What is the word again? Uh, Your passion is coming off as angry. Okay. Angry. Yeah. And, you know, angry black woman. The angry black woman, instead of saying the passionate black woman, we're labeled as angry. And I think that we have to deal with those false narratives. Um, We have to address them while trying to educate those who choose to misunderstand us on a daily basis. 
And so not only do we do that with our young leaders, but we do that with our millennial uh, in our millennial mastermind group. What are some of the things you cover in your millennial mastermind group? Well, there's a huge gap between uh, youth and adulthood, right? And it's kind of that millennial age. A lot of them are very progressive in their thinking. They're borderline successful. So we do a lot of connecting the dots for them, Um, just really almost being um, either a sponsor or mentor because they still need that affirmation because now they're going into adulthood um, as a black woman, and we want to deal with the different issues that they deal with in a supportive manner while also connecting them with other successful women to win. Okay, what's your age group? For the Millennial Mastermind or for the She Power Leadership? For the um, Empowered Leadership. For, 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 or, or I say the ages of all of the, the age groups that you work with. So for the She Power Leadership Academy, we deal with girls ages 8 to 18. Um, we, started, we, we used to do 10, but we realized that girls are growing up a little faster, and we need, them, we need to meet them a little earlier because around ages 10, 11, girls start losing their confidence. So if we can reach them earlier and build that, that's less likely to happen. And our millennial mm-hmm. mastermind is ages 19 to 35. Okay, mastermind is 19 to 35. Yes. Okay, so here you have a um, platform for women and girls benefit from their um, their diverse backgrounds and their diverse skill sets. Uh, since you have produced, developed, collaborated with over 200 events specifically empowering women and girls with attendance ranging from 20 to 2,000. What does, can you tell, tell us what that looks like? So like a lot of times when you're of, in, Okay. Is it type of event? Yes. Okay. I, I'm sorry. I definitely don't want to cut in and be rude, so I apologize for that. Oh, no, no, no. Nope, nope. We're, we're, in the, we're sitting in the living room just talking. So <laughs> okay. just talk the way you talk sitting in the living room, okay? <laughs> okay, yeah, well, go ahead. you know, there, there may be where we have um, what we call a power circle, where we bring in the leaders together and we deal with peer-to-peer mentoring or we do one-on-one mentoring, or we do group mentoring. So that may be 10 or 15 women. Um, or it may be a conference that we collaborate with and plan that will have, you know, 2,000 women in attendance here in Bakersfield. So we, you know, obviously the pandemic has affected everyone. Um, it's been very challenging because we find that the secret sauce to our success is being in the room together and feeling each other's energies. Uh, that is so critically important, and it's challenging to do that via Zoom. Um, so we're happy that we're going to be opening back up. We reopened women's, uh, the first day of Women's History Month. Um, we have several events planned this year. We're also doing a um, Love My Skin event where we're partnering with a wellness company and we're going to be painting and really focus on the wellness, the mental and physical wellness of the young girls. And we're going to do that in a beautiful space where we'll have 25 women in attendance. Uh, we partnered with Macy's who gave us 500 dresses where we'll be able to do a beauty day and give these young ladies a dress and have their hair and nails done. Uh, we've also partnered with Macy and did a fashion show uh, where we did that in the public mall. And that's a confidence builder for girls. They were able to get their makeup done, talk to estheticians, and then go on stage and model these outfits. We also do events where we bring in women leaders in our communities who tell their backstory. That's really where the power is because we see, you know, successful women like you, Dr. Lee, but if we get an opportunity to hear your backstory, that's where the magic is, and that's where the young girl can connect with you in a way to say, I am her. And so we, look, we do a variety of events. We uh, hold a gala once a year 
where we um, honor five women who are impacting girls and women's lives. Uh, we really are an event-heavy organization uh, because it's important to come together. And not only that, come together, we also use them as uh, fundraise op- opportunities a lot of times as well. How do you how do you um, reach how do you reach your audience how, or your participating girls, young ladies? Do you do you up, and, actively up until go the out pandemic? There? Up until the pandemic. Um, Here's some information. What is it? Oh, it's my phone. Sorry, I don't want information. Up until the pandemic, a lot of girls were referred to us. Um, and so we are preparing now to do more recruiting because we realize we need to uh, reach more girls. Now that we're on Zoom, we can reach more girls because now we can actually do the event virtual. But we mix it up. We partner with organizations and serve as a support uh, liaison as far as the mentorship. Um, we just really mix it up, Dr. Lee. Um, and try and serve where the need is because, again, there's no template when you're building a young okay. leader, you know, who potentially may have lost their confidence, who may be suicidal, who may be, you know, have been molested, who may be in the system. So we really mix it up on how we reach these okay. girls and where we meet them. Okay. That's real good because then you're not uh... – limiting participation to the middle class or uh, low middle class or upper lower class. You're not classing. You're not uh, categorizing the participants. It's just where the need is. And uh, Absolutely. so then you scout around or, or have within your organization professionals and, and a, a diverse type of of people to provide the services. Now, are all of your uh, your mentors, they're, they're all female? <laughs> all of our mentors are female. Um, and here's the, here's the deal. We believe that, you know, all cultures and races should coexist as we do in real life. So we are open to mm-hmm. everyone in our organizations, we are primarily a black-led organization, so a lot of times we are labeled as, you know, we, we mentor just black girls. That's not true because we have Asians, we have Indian, we have Hispanic. We're across the board of the girls that's been through our organization and are in our organization, but a lot of times when we are black-led, we get labeled as that, but we absolutely mentor any and everyone, um, and they coexist together. We have had girls whose uh, mother is a judge all the way to a girl who's single, you know, living with her single uh, parent grandma on the system. So it's across the range uh, socioeconomically because we must learn to coexist. And what these young ladies learn is at the end of the day, we really are the same, and we need to support each other as such. Do you do any historical, like, black history? Uh, teaching to um, to um, to build the self esteem and and for our black and even though though you serve everyone you 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 are black focused period yeah I mean yeah just like with my own organization we you know we the doors are open to whomever walks through the doors however. My aim and my focus is to empower and to help blacks, help our own um, African people, where, wherever they are, you know, in the on the um, in the world. And so, um, and I don't think that that's anything that we need to apologize for, or uh, because we do matter as a people. Period. I mean, we've been cast aside. Our cities have been stolen from us, and we've come to life just, you know, being led by a pack of white lies. Did you ever get into that topic with your, with your, uh, 
ethnic keys to girls and women? I have not, Dr. Lee, but I would love to. I would love to develop a curriculum around that because I think you're right. That is definitely something that we should boldly teach uh, through our academy. So I would love to continue that conversation with you to develop a curriculum uh, to implement into our program. Well, that sounds good. So let's um, want to allow our co-host or do we have any uh, callers who'd like to join us in this conversation? Just tap one on your phone and um, maybe we'll come to a young man named Michael. What are your thoughts, Michael? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, Ms. Wall. This is uh, Michael, a fellow co-host of the show. Um, I want to thank you again for joining us tonight and being willing to come and share your knowledge and experience with us. I wanted to ask you, you. whether you could give us one or two examples of how, um, you know, this nation in particular, uh, the historical patriarchal understructure of this nation has impacted the lives of women and girls and, you know, any carryovers from things of the past that uh, affect the lives of women and girls today? Well, I, I think we can just take a wide view of just our society in general. Um, we can just, number one, deal with the fact that women still are not being paid equal. When we look at the decision-making structure of who's making decision on a political uh, level as it relates to our lives, women are not there, it's primarily white men making those decisions. Uh, when we look at what happened in our nation when they're talking about defund the police and police reform, and as we dig in it, and I'm the chair of the uh, advisory council for the Kern County Sheriff's Department, and as we started digging into uh, their systems, we realized that women are not being hired or promoted at a rate that is effective. So I think that's across the board, that women are still fighting for the basic equality in life, period. Uh, if we look at the pandemic, a lot of women had to uh, quit their jobs because they're staying home to take care of the children because the children were not in school versus the men staying home and taking care of the children. And so I just think that uh, women are still fighting, unfortunately, for the basics that should be equal across the board. Absolutely. Um now, you work with, as you said, you know, women and girls of all different backgrounds, um, racially as well as socioeconomically. But just for the people listening right now who may um, still have a little bit of, um, they may not be as clear on, on uh, what exactly, you know, the organizations that you work with do. Could you briefly tell everyone what it is specifically that you do, what your goal is, your mission statement, so to speak, of, uh, of your work? Well, our, our goal, again, is to build girl leaders. And then with our, uh, when we talk about leadership opportunities, whether that is taking on a project within the community or whether that is partnering with an organization and participating, really giving girls, once we develop them as a leader, um, an opportunity to kind of flex their she power, if you so speak. I'll give you an example. Uh, she power actually formed the MLK Community Initiative in Bakersfield, California, which is in a lower socioeconomic double-digit unemployment food desert area. And so they developed these listening sessions to find out what is going on in this community and how can we help this community rebound. And then within one year, during the pandemic, uh, we were able to serve over a million pounds of food and over 20,000 hot meals, win a grant of $350,000 for community engagement education around transportation because this area doesn't have transportation. So that's an example of what our hopes is, is that not only are we building these leaders, but we're also taking them into the real life and giving them opportunity to serve or rebuild while leading in that space. Um, so we kind of go across the board depending on what the situation is at hand, what the project is at hand, and what our focus is is at that particular time as it relates to what these young ladies can have an opportunity to do. Absolutely. Um, I just wanted to ask another question. How important, if at all, um, have, has, have you found political education to be for the empowerment of women and girls, in particular, since we are you know, speaking in the context of the United States, 
how important have you ha- have you found um you know political literacy in empowering women and girls it's not an option if we're building true leaders we must have true civic engagement and teaching them how to engage um and how to have uh, political awareness and education. And I know that Dr. Tatum in Bakersfield is really on the forefront of that. So how important it is, it is critically important because uh, business and civic leadership are really at the forefront of changing the structure of our lives. Again, 85% of our girls are on a full or partial scholarship, which means they're either black or biracial when we come to Uh, our demographics, even though we do have whites and others on scholarship, that's primarily who our girls are. And these are girls, which we teach them. They talk about your law, what do they say, socially disadvantaged community. What we teach them is the difference between success and failure is more than likely an opportunity. So if they are politically aware, if they are civically engaged, they're going to know how to go after these opportunities, how to be relentless in positioning themselves to really become ambassadors of their own community. So, I, yes, it's critically important. Um, and, and just for anyone uh, listening who, you know, um, may, may need more clarification, to put it simply, because Mrs. Mrs. Waller is absolutely correct, and the reason I asked that question is because I, I pretty much knew, you know, she was going to affirm the sentiment I share about the importance of politics. But just for anyone who may need it simplified further, <laughs> policies and laws – dictate the structure and functionality of society, past and present, and in the future. If you want to know why things are the way they are, usually you can look to policies and laws that allow them to be that way or that intentionally make them be that way. Or you can look to past policies and laws that, um, through their effects over generations, have led to the current predicament, you know, any population is within. So I just want to you know, um, reemphasize the importance of that because I know that a lot of women and girls, especially, are I will say, for whatever reason, for whatever sociological reasons, usually a little bit more societally uh, perceptive and aware, I'll say, than the the male half of the population, which is for a variety of different reasons. But um, I, I know usually that with that awareness comes a a hunger, a wanting for an explanation of why things are the way they are, and just for anyone women and girls in particular looking for that, I would say, you know, whether it's difficult, whether it's unpleasant at times, turning to politics and in particular the history of politics, histories of policies and laws can really help give you those uh, answers and satisfy that need for an explanation of why things are the way they are and the best ways of changing things into a, a situation that you more prefer. And I think while they're in that space, They also have to understand, not allow someone to push them to one corner or the other, uh, to divide them in a way they cannot get the information. I'll give you an example. We're working with a group of about 25 women. Over, It's been 30 years, and it's actually, I'm serving as a statewide advisory um, uh, council for black women wellness. There has not been a policy written for black women wellness in 30 years in California. And then we wonder why our mortal rate is so high, why black women are dying at the hands of doctors. There hasn't been a policy written. There's not laws written. There's no protection for her. And so you're absolutely right. If we look into our history and we wonder why there's a divide or lack, the answers are in there. So you're absolutely right on that. Uh, b- before I uh, allow someone else to jump in here, I just want to ask one more question. It's uh, particularly relevant to the show and to the work Dr. Lee herself does. Um, what role does entrepreneurship play in your plan to empower women and girls? The foundation for really what we do is business and civic leadership. That's the foundation. So business, microenterprising, all that is critically important uh, we actually have seen young girls who have launched businesses right out of our academy and are actually doing pretty good about it, you know, just, and they start businesses as young as 10 years old. I often wear uh, jewelry pieces from one of the leaders who started a jewelry business. We have another young girl who each year, she has a nonprofit 
uh, that she started, and she collects about 100 uh, bags a year full with uh, school supplies and things like that for children. Uh, we have another young girl who started a YouTube channel, and the list goes on. So to answer your question, business is very foundational. Um, and, and not even, even if you work with someone, you still can, you know, microenterprise uh, something. And so, yeah, it's very foundational. Absolutely, I agree. Yeah, I'm so happy to hear that, um, that your strong focus on business and civic leadership. Okay. And as you were speaking about the, um, you know, about the policies, you know, there hasn't been a wellness policy written uh, for for black women, you said in over 30 years, in 30 years, um, just kind of like, like my mind went back, and it's probably longer than 30 years, when, um, and I don't know if there's anyone on the line who can remember when a woman, uh, a, a woman could not, a mother could not de- uh, decide or determine, you know, make the decision to do birth control. And, um, mm. you know, without the, you know, without the husband's consent. And so, <laughs> you know, just thinking, you know, <laughs> And I do recall, I do remember that when it actually issued, and I mean, it was huge. I mean, it was a huge uh, matter back then when, you know, women were having large families and they couldn't say, I mean, you know, husband and wife, you know, both had to sign for birth control. And so we have we have come a long way, but yet and still you say there still isn't anything in thirty years. That's um, quite. And that's um, for black women. <laughs> that's for black women, right? For black women. Yes. I, I want to go to our uh, audience. Uh, we do have uh, some lines with some questions, and then we'll come back after we after we talk to our listeners. We're going to come back and ask. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Cannon to uh, to comment. So we're going to go to Eric Code three zero one zero three eight six. Eric Code is three zero one and your four zero three eight six. You are live. You're just thank you. Name where you're calling from. Thank you, Berenice uh, Springdale, Maryland, and I just want to say that this is a very um, powerful um, podcast, and I was invited by um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Tatum, and um, I'd like to ask bullying within for young girls, boys as well, but bullying is a problematic as well as detrimental to physical and mental health. And is that being addressed um, as far as self-esteem or how to deal with bullying within your program? Absolutely. And here's the deal about bullying. If you don't have the conversation around it, it depends on where that young lady, you know, space, where she lives. She may not even understand she's being bullied. And we've had that situation where they didn't even know they were being bullied. And so we were able to help them frame it and understand it um, and stand up for themselves and take next actions. So, yes, we do address that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. Yes, bullying is definitely a huge issue. That probably isn't a topic that we can talk about that I haven't experienced personally or or had you know, someone in the immediate family. So we're going to go to Dr. Cannon. Absolutely. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. This has been some outstanding conversation, and, and really I wanted to jump in on so many points because I believe our programs need to be effective. You know, I've seen good programs all across the country, male and female, and I I, having five sons um, and living in America all my life, I've got three sisters. I don't have any daughters, but my heart goes out to young men in this country. 
But it also goes out to the young women because I know that there's brokenness on so many different levels and so many women have been silenced and, and quieted and so many women have to hide behind their makeup and their 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 fix up and their their gadgets and gets up. And and I find that a lot of the problems are in the family. And a lot of the problems is in how they talk to deal with relationships. Before they get into the business world, a lot of women make mistakes of getting pregnant too soon, uh, dropping out of school too soon. My question is, I've got some ideals on how we definitely can go live and take your program just the way we're doing it with the young men. And I want I would like to talk about that, but if I could dive in just a little bit into the mindset of, of the program, um, in looking at, do you teach these women how to deal with the world without their families, to deal with the world without uh, a man relationship, or or do you teach them how to build good male-female relationships, how to build good relationships back home, or are you teaching the girls how to be independent of home and how to be independent of a male relationship? That is a loaded question, <laughs> Dr. Shadow. But I'll tell you this, we're covering all the bases. Um, because, again, not having a template for our program and meeting the girls where they are, they're at different stages, right? Um, typically, the girls are mentored in 10 or less in a group, so they're consistently meeting with the same uh, girls, the same mentor, so they're learning how to build friendships. A lot of times, uh, girls don't know truly what a friendship is and what it means. So a lot of times we have to start at the basis of that. And that is a huge, huge uh, space that we have to enter with these young ladies of really understanding what that is and also how to be a friend. You would think that everybody knows that, but they don't. And that's why I think when you look at uh, women who have gone into adulthood, they don't know how to be friends or how to keep friends because they didn't learn that. Um, as a young girl, so yes, we do deal with that. Um, I'm, I'm as curious. Far as... I'm trying to make, I'm trying to make real quick. I'm trying to make everybody happy, and joyful, and whole. Um, you know, letting them, you know, be true to who they are. If a young lady comes and says, you know, really in my heart of hearts, I feel like I'm a, a boy. Where would you encourage her in in her she power at that point? Would you emphasize the strength of who she is or would her desire or lust to be a boy? Well, we've dealt with this in our academy, Dr. Tatum, and it is not my job at that point in time to take my personal beliefs and inflict them on her. It is my job as her mentor to really explore all the spaces she's in, all the emotion, and to find professional support to help her. I'm not qualified to help her in that space. So we do partner with other organizations who are qualified to help her, and it is our job to serve as mentor, to be a support, to either help her get through it or help her come out of it. So to answer I'm your curious. question, it is a case-by-case. I'm curious what in in all of our good programs what different what what where's the difference from what the church does in gathering the women around uh church events and and Sunday school and the difference from what uh Miss Teen USA Miss Universe uh the debutante balls that are very prevalent across the country to help young women build their self-esteem all of the sororities what, what particularly do we do different with she power that's not being done in the churches and not being done in the secular uh, debutante balls, uh, Miss Teen USA, Miss Universe? So I haven't been in any, any of those spaces, sororities, debutante, I haven't been in any of those spaces, but I've been in the church space. So I'm going to speak from that perspective. In the church space, Dr. Cannon, you walking in, you have expectations to be who they believe you should be. 
to be where they should, you should be. And so people tend to shy away from the church because they can't come in and be who they are authentically, whether that is idea for our society or not. With She Power, you truly can come in and be authentically who you are without judgment. Now, I have my own personal beliefs on that, and we've had this conversation uh, before on what I believe, and it's hard for me sometimes. But my job as a mentor is to be the support she needs. I have sat outside of a home for three hours texting a young lady who was suicidal. Now, I don't understand why she's suicidal, but my job is to support her. If there's a young girl who believes she's a boy, I may not understand that, but it is my job as a mentor to be supportive and help her, support her through whatever she's going through. I've worked with young girls who've been molested by their father. Now, I don't support that, but it is my job that, to support her. In that sense, I'm curious, in that sense where a telephone call has to be made, if you know that as a as a uh, mandatory what, reporter, um, I'm curious if you have any confidence before you call the police, before you call the magistrate, do you have any confidence in calling the church that these young girls will get help in the church? Or have we totally lost faith? And the power, the deliverance, the hope that the church brings, the structure, the morality. I guess the question I'm asking is a lot of times when you find women, like I said, and I've seen so many too in so many broken situations, and they may not get the help if you call the authorities. Or if, so I'm asking, going, can you call the church? Will you feel comfortable calling any church before you would call the police, even in an abuse situation. Let's say where a young man in the family has touched somebody or done something to the young girl, telephone call has to be made. Have we lost confidence in calling the church? We have lost confidence in calling the church. And here, let me tell you why, Dr. Cannon. The church in where I live have not stood strong as the armors and held the community up. They're very silent. They're very quiet. They're not in the forefront saying, we are here for whatever you need. Let us support you. Now, that may not be everybody's situation. Um, I do have a couple of churches that I, I do work with, but not mm-hmm. in that space. That, is not even, that has not even been a thought. Now, and I'm being completely honest and transparent because I'm here to grow just like the next person, that that has not been a call that I've ever made. Since they have so many hurting women, though, in those churches, you're absolutely right. Even when an abortion or a pregnancy takes place, a lot of times the women are silent. They have no programs. Would it make sense for you to work along with the pastor's wives in these church to maybe come with a template program where you could mentor them you know, because it did, we do have a whole lot of silent women hurting in the church and outside the church, but if the church already has a steeple, it already has seats, it already has structure, it already has a building, and that church belongs to us in our communities and is closed two days a week, what if it opens up for you three days a week and, and whatever city you, you – you, I think I'm asking the question, is there any way with – Working with these young ladies is powerful, the program you have. You know, like uh, Brother Cornel West said, you know, lift every voice. Every voice makes a difference in what you're doing. But how can we work with the structures throughout the community? We can't just say, well, we've lost faith in them. We can't. They've got million-dollar buildings. They've got structure in there. And I think a lot of the pastors will be open if you, you follow the protocol, go through their structure to set up a template in their church. You're absolutely hitting on something, Dr. Cannon, and I would love to continue the conversation around that. Uh, I have knocked on some churches in our organization as it relates to economic development, and they have opened the door. So I think you're definitely hitting on something. I would love to continue that conversation. I do think it's important that CBOs and churches uh, come together to save the black community. I absolutely agree with you on that. What's lastly, what's your, what's your personal thoughts on the Negro project many years ago by uh, Miss um, Margaret Sanger and that whole movement? Uh, are you familiar with that? I don't think I am. Okay. Appreciate it. 
Appreciate it, Dr. Lee. Really do. Great conversation, y'all. This is outstanding. This is the month of the women, and, and if we could give every one of your powerful supervisors a show just like this, we could mentor it off of this show. We could start with yours, then give all of and then all those young ladies in every city, let's, let's give them a show. Let's think like a producer. Now you're meeting with them the night before on a conference on what they're talking about on their show, and now you're empowering those ladies. And it's something empowering when a group of five young ladies do a show together, and, and they control that show. They host the show. It's so empowering that I think with Dr. Lee – and yourself, we can we can help you work that into all of your programs real easy, smoothly. Doctor, uh, the whole team can attest to we can make this happen. But I think to empower women out of this this month coming out of March, I say let's do your own show. And anybody else that want to do a show in the month of April, and we got you. <laughs> I appreciate that. Uh, you know, I think we definitely have to, and just really. I uh, have an op- Dr. Tatum introduced me to Dr. Lee, and when I had the opportunity to go and, and read about her, you know, it's just honored to be in her presence. So I think if yeah. we can continue that kind of, uh, you know, thing, I think we can switch this around. Beautiful. I appreciate it, everybody. It's been great, great conversation. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tanner. Uh, very, very uh, great uh, observations and points. I do would like to um uh, to piggyback on you on a question and your response, uh, I was wondering if, what, what are you saying that in regards to a, making this particular call uh, regarding uh, molestations, you know those types of things that when you learn about, you know within a, a program, we're mandated as a professional, we're supposed to call you know, certain authorities, whether it be child care, police, or, or whomever. And the question was, have you, you know, considered to making that call to the church? And you said that, um, that that's a call that you've never had to make. Now, were you saying it was a call that you had never made to the church or a call that you never had to make to an authority because that situation has never presented itself. A call that I never made to the church. Okay, a call you never made to the church. And yeah. uh, and, and I concur with you. It would be in, in that position. And, and I have been in positions, in, in that type of position, where I felt that, you know, my, my trust in the church wasn't, strong enough, or, or in the individuals, when I say church, you know, we're the church, you know, we're individually, we're the church, we're, we, we embody the Holy Spirit, and so, you know, within us, and so we we are the church, the building isn't the church, however, the people who run the church, the, the pastors, the, the elders, the, the deacons, and those who are in authority, I I have total confidence in the spirit of God. I have total confidence in my spirituality, you know, my relationship with the Most High. But because of certain experiences with the individuals who run the church, then my confidence is not that strong because many of them have been perfect. I have been perpetrators. They they've been ones who have actually done acts, committed acts on you know the youth and, and different ones and and uh, even single women to prey upon single women a lot. So in your experiences and your mentoring, have have you kind of run across that? <laughs> you know, I, I tell you, I've. <laughs> <laughs> I, I believe, be careful, lady. Um, be, care, be careful, though, lady. Be careful, though, because I'm gonna respond. So be careful, lady. Be real careful here. I believe all tides rising, we win. And so, in every situation, we can find something that's not favorable, but we also can find something that's good. Um, I agree with yeah. you. My faith is faith is in the man above. 
And so when we are working with these young girls, we're looking for opportunities and situations to build them as a leader. That is our focus, mm-hmm. to build them as a leader, right, through mentorship, personal development, and diverse leadership opportunities. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I hadn't hadn't included the church, and the church hadn't included me. I did have, mm-hmm. there's, a, there's an organization here, I won't say any names, who sent a message to me and said, I need to sit down because I didn't get permission to come into an area that I'm working in right now to rebuild it. And the reason mm-hmm. that is is because in that area, those ministers are super passive. I'm just going to be 100% honest, but I'm sure there's some good ones because I've worked with some of the good pastors there. So I think we have to collaborate. I do like the idea of potentially seeing what that could look like because they have a built-in audience of hurting women. And if we can reach them and empower them, I'm for that. I'm not looking at what this minister do or don't do. I'm looking at how can we heal these young girls and these women. And so I'm going to go in focusing on that. Um, And I'm going to be unapologetic about it. I'm going to be relentless about it. Your personal life has nothing to do with what I'm coming in here to do for this young girl and for this young woman. And I hope that answers your question without me getting into the weeds. <laughs> Beautiful case. You know okay. what? Dr. Dr. I'm going to tell you where, where, where you uh, know, Dr. Lee, would I be able to, to interject yeah. comment? Oh, sure. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, uh, yeah, because uh, the Dr. Cannon reminded me of something I wanted to um, uh, mention in relation to things he said about the church, because I do hear a lot of people bring this point up. I just want to, you know, m- make the point that Oftentimes it isn't so much, it can be, but oftentimes it isn't so much whether someone has faith or a lack of faith in an institution like uh, a church, but it's a matter of resources, right? It's an objective fact that obviously a church is not going to have the same type of resources um, available to deal with, something like, uh, say, an unwanted pregnancy due to, you know, molestation or rape as actual professionals who work in, in that field wheel, like in the, in the healthcare right. industry, right? So you wouldn't say if you had an uh, unwanted pregnancy because of something as as horrible as rape, you wouldn't really expect to go to a church and have them be able to do something about it, medically speaking. That's something you want to take to a medical professional that has expertise specifically dealing with these types of of incidents, these types of crimes. So I think most times it's a matter of resources and people, women and girls, realize that churches don't have the same resources for dealing with the same uh, problem as, as do actual trained professionals that that you know get their degree that practice clinically in helping individuals in these specific situations so um, i think that should also be 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 uh something that's mentioned and that's on the minds of people as they think about what, what they're hearing is that it's the difference in resources um exactly. let me say something michael I'll, 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 I'll stand you. can i can i can i i want to respond real quickly um, because this is so passionate, y'all, and this is, this is real conversation <laughs> here, and we don't want to bypass it. I appreciate Dr. Lee bringing the conversation back. And, you know, when we look at the church, it almost brings tears to my eyes right now to hear, you know, ladies say that we may have lost faith in the church because I know the history of the church, all of them, the Church of God in Christ, the Baptist, the Presbyterian, the Methodist, particularly the black churches in this country. And it was strong, dedicated, faithful black men and women that labored in these churches, like my grandmother, like Bishop McKinney in San Diego, like uh, Charles Blake in L.A., like powerful, powerful brothers that are educated. Now, here's the thing. If we take our children, I'm not talking about a rape. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. I'm not talking about a rape, but let's say in a family where a, a cousin touched another cousin, and it's normal and it's touching, but the sister is mad, she's upset, a telephone call needs to be made. If we cannot trust those in our community that's in our churches that got master's degrees, counseling degrees, doctor's degrees, if we think our people are so evil that we can't even take our people to our churches, not the Mexican churches, the white churches, but the black churches in our community to make sure our sons get what they need, make sure our daughters get what they need, 
Some people judge the church has never been to Sunday school more than 30 days in their life. So they don't know what's there. They don't know what's in those youth fellowships. I was a young man in San Diego. My story is I was a part of the Crips in San Diego, knucklehead, doing knucklehead things, breaking in the homes, snatching purses, doing knucklehead things with all my partners. But I heard about a church, and I got in the church, and I got serious at 15. And I, I went to the brotherhood meetings, and I got in the choir. I got in the youth fellowship. I listened to men that wasn't pushing dope on the street, and all they had was a conversation. I was listening to older men that, that had a history to tell. And then when I left San Diego, I went to Concord, North Carolina, and I went to college there because the church helped me get it together. And I hooked in with a church there, and I learned every church in that community. I'm telling you I did. I was at 18. I got in the church, and I learned them brothers. Them brothers taught me some stuff. And if anybody thinks that I, you would rather turn your, your son over to a, a police that's going to put handcuffs on him, and they're not going to listen to his story. They're going to try to make, get him to make a confession. And when he gets in that jail cell, if he doesn't get raped and molested over and over again and become a perpetrator, the chances of him getting the real help that he needs in that man's system, it's not going to happen. But if, if as a mandatory reporter, if we don't have, counseling ourselves that we're creating like probably Booker T. Washington probably would have done, like Mary Bethune would have done, instead of turning our children over to a system that you know they're not going to get the help. They're going to get more rape, more molested. They're going to become more perpetrators. That's, that's the prison system. That's the foster care system. So you would say you have more faith in the, the foster care system, the prison system, and the criminal justice system than the church that's been laboring for black people for 200 years? Uh, Dr. Cannon, would you mind if I um, ask the ask you a question for purposes of clarification? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I listened to everything you said. I appreciate your your addition to the conversation. Um, I just wanted to ask a hypothetical: if someone came to you, uh, let's say a younger person, whether male or female, and they told you that they were reaching out. Uh, to you because, you know, they were hoping that you could hook them up with someone who could help them deal with a particular trauma they had from whatever experience in their life gave them that trauma. Would you personally refer them to, you know, someone in the church who was, let's say, uh, unlicensed as a therapist um, who doesn't really specialize in therapy? Or would you refer them to someone who is licensed as a therapist who does work in therapy and specifically work with people um, to, you know, um, get rid the, of or the manage black, their trauma. In, yeah, in the black church, number one, sir, do you realize how many Caleb scholars the black church have put out? There's no institution in America that have put out more at doctors and master's degrees than the church from the Presbyterian. From the time that they allowed us as slaves to start reading, we start building black churches. They Absolutely. wouldn't let us read, so we had to get educated. And as we get educated, we start doing for our own. And we, yes, I would, I would pull some of the most powerful brothers that I know that are skilled, whether it's in molestation, rape, and skilled. And I would have them to sit with that young man. I'd put, and I and I'd have them to tell their story. If I could get his daddy to come, I'd get his daddy to come, his brothers to come, and we would pour around that young man and remind him. Sir, you are a man And even though your daddy's not here You're still a man And I would build that young man If he And I would tell him I had a young man say If my girlfriend don't give it to me tonight 14 year old young boy Saying it to his partner If my, if, if my girlfriend don't give it to me tonight I'm going to take it from her And I turned to him And I said I looked him in his eye I was driving And I said young man If you do that's rape he, and I could tell he had never had a man look him in his eye and talk to him like that. All his partners was nigging him on. Yeah, man, that's what I do too. So what I'm saying is that absolutely I would surround him with some powerful brothers that believe in God. 
They may not be perfect. Some of them may have stories where they've been touched, but they've overcome that thing. You know, so I would take them immediately to some of these powerful churches before I would definitely call the police. Before I would call those other people that's faking and shaking, want to get our kids hooked on Ritalin, and want to get our kids hooked into that system, we, we can. We got to look behind the veil. I have a show on Friday night called The Purple Truth. Let's look behind the veil and see what's really going on in some of this stuff, so we can make intelligent decisions. If a telephone has to, if a call has to be made in a family, I'm talking about in a family. And one one of the nephews and nieces might have to get taken off in in handcuffs. You telling me there's no wisdom in the family, nowhere to help figure that out that we got to call the police in here. We don't have no pastors, nobody that we trust that we can call them to the house and sit that young man down and let him know what he did was and 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 bring that thing to an end. All my sisters, because they was in the church, I got three of them. When they left my mama's house, they were virgin when they, and they married their husband. Okay, so the church was a part of that, and I think that's valuable. They built great relationships, and the church was a part of that. If we try to do this and build women's self-esteem and build them up and all that, we're going to make uh, hoochie mamas out of them. If we're teaching them how to dance and, and shake it and, and teach them how to dress up and make up, but we haven't touched those real heart issues, we setting them up for the, the pimps and stuff that's waiting on them. We cannot bypass the church if you really want to build women. If I want to build these young brothers, I got to get them in a church, sitting down, listening to some wisdom, because they already think they got it. Dr. Cannon. Yes. Let me ask you a question. Yes, ma'am. I don't disagree with what you said to an extent, but the church has a responsibility as well. For anyone to not automatically, now I never said, I just want to be really clear, and I'm not saying you said I said this, I never said that I, the church wasn't an option. You asked had I ever made that call, and I said no, I had not. So if the church is not your first thought for help, for the healing, and, and, and for the hurt, there has to be some responsibility on the church part. There has to be something that the church is not order for that to be my first call that I make. Let me, let me ask me you one to, question. For me, me to sit here question. and say, I've never even thought to make that call. Let me let me ask you one question. Are you aware that there's probably 10 pastors in your city that if you call them, they probably would stay up all night long for free of charge sitting and talking with your young ladies? Are you aware that there's pastors' wives, probably about 50 of them in your city, that if you would call them and, and ask them to help mentor you and y'all mentor each other, I bet you they would sit with you and those young ladies free of charge all night long. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Pastor Tatum's on the line. He's here in Bakersfield. I, I've made calls to him, and he's come, you know, in a second for various situations. But you asked me a very specific question. Had I made that call for that particular situation, and my answer was no. It's not that I don't call pastors or pastors' wives. That's not the case. But that wasn't my first thought when you're talking about a, a girl that is hurting right here. That wasn't my first call. I do yeah, because my, that's not how is, I built this program. Yeah, and I'm not – this is not a – please, it's not a direct attack to you on your program. I love what you're doing. No, I'm not taking I'm, I'm it that more, way at all. I'm, yeah, I'm more speaking to the climate of the fact that not only you, I, and, uh, Dr. Tatum, I've asked a lot of people that same question because that's a problem to me. That's a problem mm-hmm. to me that, you know, I agree there's, there's abuse in the homes, there, there's, there's, there's uncles touching, there's, there's stuff going on that shouldn't be going on, and some of it even in the church. But, you know, I think Jesse Jackson said, can't nobody help us but us. Okay, but if we're willing to turn our children in those type of situations, I find this and answer this question just in dealing with young ladies. And this is just a random question. No, no, nothing, nothing. And anybody can answer this. This is interesting to me that in the school system, if a young kid go and they ask the kid, did your daddy or mama beat you or hit you? The kid know not to say that. So they can't be tricked into that. But if if they say, 
uh, do your mama touch you, your daddy touch you? The kid might say, yeah, they touch, we touch all the time. But that's enough right there for the school system to open up a case, the word touch. I asked the fisher, which one would cause you to open up a case quicker uh, if the kids say touch or beat? So that's my question. In your experience with the young ladies, if if a young girl says touch or my mama beat me or whooped me or she or he, she touched me or my daddy touched me, which one would cause a greater alarm? Well, obviously the touch uh, would cause a greater alarm, but in, now, in our program final, we explore. I yeah, I didn't say final. I didn't say rape. I didn't say molest. Yeah. I just said touch. So if they yeah. can manipulate our children just to go along with that touch, they can open up cases on our families, and they've done that. So how can we turn our children over to a system that's going to manipulate every single word that they say, good or bad? Now, if the child says, my daddy raped me, he touched me in my, my private part, I got it. All they need is the word just touch. Is that correct? Well, I, I want to take that a step further, if I can. Just our program, in those situations, because we are building safe spaces where girls can come in and know that they're safe, right? Whatever they want to talk about, whatever they're dealing with, it's a safe space. And if we come across a situation we have to deal a little differently, we deal accordingly. But we explore what that means. We explore in that conversation where she openly talks about whatever her experiences is and know that she has a mentor there that's going to help her become a whole woman. So there, there's, so in our program, I can't speak to the public school system, but in our program, in group session, we have, we have peer, we have peer on peer, one-on-one and group. And then sometimes we do three-way mentoring where we include a parent or parents. It depends on the situation and where the young lady is. Okay, I want to thank our I want to thank our audiences audience for being so patient. We do have more callers, and so I want to thank you for being patient. And we are uh, we are getting to you right now, um, Doctor Lee. Would I be able to just quickly um, offer I don't know something of a, a proposition of resolution to to Doctor Cannon's uh, problem he pointed out? Yes, yes. Go ahead, and then once you're done with that, then caller Erico three one three. Four eight zero five. You will be live. Okay, go ahead, Michael. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Dr. Cannon, I think um, both you and um, uh, Miss Waller actually uh, agree on some things. Maybe there's a little bit kind of muddying the water or um, mucking up the, the communication, um, because you know you both do, um, you know, value the you, you value certification and professionalism, right? You, you value yeah. someone knowing what they're doing. And I think the issue here isn't so much that um, the church is seen always as uh, a place not to trust, but rather seen as a place, understandably, that does not have the resources um, as much as, let's say, uh, the medical institution specifically designed to deal with mental health issues or even physical health issues of women and girls. And I think that maybe a solution could be, could be uh, constructed here where both sides could agree that you know, I don't know, a policy or a program to fund churches so that members of the church can get certified and, and obviously meaning members of the community in that church can get certified as licensed psychologists, psychiatrists, medical professionals who can work with these girls. So, you know, that could maybe be something to bridge both sides together because you, you put a importance on the church. And I think Ms. Waller is understandably putting importance on the the um you know certification and the the expense of the individual dealing with these individuals these women and girls and i think if you merge those two and put someone with experience and certification dealing with people in these situations inside a church that could maybe bring both of your sides together is that something that you would maybe agree to that's a whole nother conversation <laughs> okay. okay. I mean, it's something that I certainly uh, agree to. Um, you know, I, with my own person, my own background as a, um, I'm a master in divinity, an ordained pastor since the 70s. And uh, one thing that I've, I've often said 
is that within our church, uh, we do be professional. And uh, because many times with our training and in this uh, area of, of pastorship, uh, we, we, we don't get that training uh, to actually even be a Christian counselor. Now, now since I did my own MDS, they do provide that. Uh, and MDIV comes along now with a professional degree, so it's a dual degree. I wish they had that when I was was going, but um, you, it's very before important. Before you go to the, before you yeah before you go to the caller, let me say something. You know what I find honestly in the church, because I went in there wide open asking a lot of questions as a young man. I found that most people don't know how to approach the pastor or the deacons or whatever structure they got into the church to get their program in place. All those churches that I told you from San Diego to North Carolina that I got involved in, and that was before Nick Cannon was my son, I took good programs to all of those pastors, and they were so grateful and welcome and open and excited to what else do you got? I mean, I took brothers to the street doing the crack epidemic. I had young people doing shows. We were out. I got vid- I got 30 years of videotape what we did with the churches. Mm-hmm. Every What I find is you got good people that got master's degrees sitting and they timid. Mm-hmm. They sitting in these, yeah. they got the right education. And they timid to come up with something and present the ideal and say, Pastor, mm-hmm. I want to do this on Thursday night. I want to do this mm-hmm. on Thursday morning. And so they sit and they, they, they get offended or envious because somebody mm-hmm. else is in position, and they sit and waiting in the congregation for the pastor somebody to call them and say, you, you right there, come up here and show us how great your gift mm-hmm. is. Instead of packaging that, that, everything I took to the pastors, from Noel Jones, Bishop Omer, to T.D., everything I've taken to these brothers, they, they've always, mm-hmm. it was a little rough. I might have had some misspellings. I got somebody to fix it and took it to them. They've always embraced it, put money behind it, mm-hmm. ideals. What I find is we don't have enough uh, um, excited people, creative people. Mm-hmm. We got these churches in every city across. The, we the laughing stock of the communities. Mm-hmm. We got more. But keep in mind, keep in mind, Doctor Cannon, you are male. You're male, okay? Yes, and ma'am. so you're you're male going to a male. And even in the churches, in female, when I became, when, when I did my MDiv, I was the seventh female admitted into this MDiv, uh, into the theological seminary. I was the seventh female graduate with a Master's in Divinity at, a, at this university. So, you know, we're not listened to that way back in that time, or even today, as as a woman, as a as well, a black girl, people too, black, black people, all of us is black people. My aunt, Kay yeah, Shannon but I'm saying a black, black woman. woman going to a black pastor, and and and, and, and I've done a I lot agree. of this. I agree. Yeah, I, so I agree. When we, I agree. Yeah, I think, and, that and, and I'm going to even interject this. So we're going to go to our caller. I will even interject this. I was a single black woman in the church, okay? And I cannot even tell you the caliber of bishops and pastors who tried to, who, who, who approached me inappropriately. These were my leaders. These were the pastors and bishops that I had confidence in that who propositioned me to, to be their mistress, to take promise to take care of me and my kids, just you know, keep this quiet. So now, now, this is a challenge. I, I agree the spirit, I'm talking about the me of, personally. I'm not talking about anybody yeah. else. I'm talking. Well, the spirit of lust is everywhere. The spirit of lust is in the courtroom. Yes, it's in it the judge, is. It's in the school. Yes, it is. And now, what I appreciated with a sister, if if I got too frank and she say, "Brother, you that was out of line. I still love you, but that's not, don't ever do that again." I appreciate you, sister. Because I was, you know what? I'm, not I'm, no a, I'm gonna tell you this. No I, was, I have been clothing. excommunicated from churches because I stood my ground. 
because I stood my ground. It wasn't because some, some you know, made up story, you know, she didn't do this and she didn't do that, but it was because I stood my ground as a woman uh, who's going to I, not lay on my back to get anywhere. First proposition well, I just, got as an 18-year-old girl, as an 18-year-old oh young lady going to my first Fortune 500 company, oh, you want to move up here in this in this industry, in this in this business, you know, see what you bought? No, that wasn't going to happen. And it never did. I walk away, and I did. Not only that, even in the political arena, you know, and, and I'm not afraid to stay. You know, it happened, it happened. I'm, I'm a full-grown woman now, and I don't fear anything or anyone. Congressional Amen. Black Caucus. When I well, first my, my got involved with the Congressional Black Caucus back in the 70s, in the early 70s when it was being formulated, what was the first thing I got? A proposition. You know, I don't live that life. And I never did it. I would admonish any young woman, any young girl, any single parent, single grandparent as I am right now today, you know, hold on to your dignity. You know, your values, your moral values. You don't have to let down for anybody, anyone, anywhere. I'm a witness. They will come at you. You will get excommunicated, maybe. You will get accused. Well, you know, so you know, I got a, I got a lot of partners and brothers that I know. You can tell they got a playboy spirit. Everything they talk about is woman, woman, woman. And you got, you know, that's in the, that's everywhere. And I've talked to brothers, my sons. I have to tell you, hey, that's not the. You want to mm-hmm. build women up. You don't want to tear them down. But my question is, Doctor Lee, and to the ladies that's listening. Let's say if you was talking to a powerful man like a Bill Cosby, and you in his presence, and you ain't seeing him do no criminal stuff, but you can see some little indiscretions, and what you know as a black woman, I'm not going to attack him, but I got to talk to him because, bro, you going to make us look bad. Your pants is down. You hanging your pants down walking around here. How does the powerful women, and I guess that's the question I want to ask uh, to our guests too, how do you prepare the ladies, the young girls, to speak to the indiscretions of the brothers? We can't throw the brothers away. And a lot of us got hooked on a lot of crazy drugs, crack, meth, the system, okay, whatever. Whatever our ills are, is, I asked my Aunt Kate, she taught, taught at Harvard, a black studies for females. She was the first woman ordained in the Presbyterian Church. I said, what do you want to say to black men? What, she said that we're not the enemy. As black women, we are not your enemy, black men. I said, I got that. I can take that to the brothers. Let's don't make these women our enemy. So if that's the thing, what do you say to a brother when you see his pants hanging down? Or do you teach these women how to speak to that? Don't walk past that. That's your brother. Or Bill Cosby in a high situation where he's going to blow it for all of us, and you see it. Do you speak to it, or do you add to it? Should that young lady, Anders Cummins, or whatever her name was, that brought Bill Cosby, should she have spoke to that issue, as to that black man, to stand up and be strong, cut that foolishness out, or should she took him to the police and get him locked up for life? Are you teaching these young ladies to help these young brothers? Because that's a part of who they are, too, right? Well, and I think that that would have to come in degrees or steps. I don't think, first of all, first thing I'm going to teach any young, and I'm sorry, um, Arlena, first thing I'm going to teach any young lady is to love yourself. Yes. Love you. Love who you are. You know, there. take care of you first. This particular individual has, that's his problem or her problem. Okay. I'm going to deal with that individual. I'm not going to make that individual uh, be responsible for or feel responsible for the actions of someone else. 
No, I'm not going to do that. I'm saying what I'm not going to do. I'm not, you know, I'm not a therapist, but I'm talking from Dr. Mary Lee. This is well, you me. know, Dr. Lee, this one of the what I'm going to do. I'm going to take there. my daughter. I'm going to take my niece. I'm going to take who, uh, and the other young lady who comes to me, say, love you. Love you first. Okay, let's deal with who you are. How do you but, feel? What, and, but in, and, most that's soci- what in most societies, particularly in America, in most countries, wherever you go, that young girl eventually has to grow up and, for lack of a better word, give herself away to a man. And whatever those rules of contract and marriage or whatever that is, she has to know how to navigate through that and be trained to do that, you know, and yes. that comes from the mother. And so as the mother shares, you know, beautiful about who and she is. And we have to tell our stories, too. We have to tell our stories as women. One to the other, to our children, to our young ladies. We we have to share, and we do this in our private circle, you know, so that one can't open up to the other, you know, peer to peer. Because we have experiences. You can't, there's some things that you, you just not feel, you don't feel comfortable, and, and they're not going to feel comfortable in sharing and, and talking about it. Yes, with anyone, we have to win their confidence. You know, they got to know that I care about you. I love you. They have to know Uh, this. uh, Dr. um, Cannon, open up. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Kennan, um, what uh, Dr. Lee was saying about teaching self-respect actually goes back to your point of uh, women learning to grow up because part of growing up is learning, you know, what your standards are and what your boundaries are. And the sooner and better um, a woman learns that, then she'll be able to better inform a man, you know, what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. But that does start with, um, I you could call it self-love and um, self-respect, knowing what your own standards and boundaries are, knowing what your values are as a woman so that you can inform and communicate that um, to males, you know, inform males of that. So I think you you guys are both hitting on very important um, points that are actually interconnected here. I think we're missing a critical point. I think we're missing a critical point. Here's the critical point we're missing. We're always giving women messages on how to act and what to say. It's time for men to take some responsibility in their actions Absolutely. because we're so busy trying to accommodate them. Why don't you stop harassing women? Stop sexualizing women. Start de- stop demeaning women. We need to start talking to the men. It is time for them to claim some responsibility because we're building our girls to be confident. Just like Dr. Lee was raised as a confident young lady. So she knew at 18, I don't need to uh, give away my goodie back to get promoted. That's the type of women we're building. But it's time for men to become stronger, to take their rightful places. That's where the problem is right now in our men not being strong and being weak. It's causing a problem for us women because we're leading. Absolutely. How do you, how yes. do you, how do okay. you say that? We're going to go, we're gonna go to caller 4805. Let's let him in. Let's let the caller in, uh, 4805. That was beautiful. Eric code 313, you're live. Hello, can Hello? can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Yes, okay, we can yeah. Hear you. Uh, I say I I agree that empowering uh, women is critical, uh, black women especially. And um, <clears throat> one of the one of the basis for this is because me myself, you know, I have I have a daughter. Uh, however, my daughter is mixed, so uh, because I have, you know, I I dealt with some you know, running the streets and stuff like that, uh, getting caught up in the system. I dealt with some periods of incarceration on the West Coast and the and uh, here out in the Midwest. So I haven't been able to be there. So um, I definitely could use some advice on how to uh, empower my daughter, um, you know, uh, entrepreneurially, you know, maybe possibly into the future, me and her developing some type of business together, um, but me personally, you know, um, in my life, I have been habitually uh, torn down by, um, you know, black women. Um, I have uh, dealt with a lot of hatred and rejection from black women, and I don't understand what that where that comes from. Um, there's a lot of anger 
it would be interesting to figure out how to deal with that. However, um, seeing that the mother role is the most dominant role in the, especially the African American community and even in Africa, um, the women have to take a responsibility. Uh, of course, we always want to put and vilify uh, the males and um, having the women be the perpetual victims, but in, even in Africa, it's the women who perform the genital mutilation, uh, not the men. Um, and in the United States, unfortunately, as of recently, African American women have uh, had the highest level of abortion. Now, interestingly enough, um, a fetus in early stages are all inherently biologically female. So when you abort the baby at the early stages, uh, most likely 100% of those those fetuses before they have matured were all female. You know, until those hormones and stuff are introduced and the baby is turned into a male, the, all those uh, embryos and stuff like that are female. So when a woman aborts, she's aborting a female. And then the, the genital mutilation issue in Africa is a, being inflicted by other women. So according to the Willie Lynch conspiracy, um, women who are African-American women or the slaves were put into a state of bondage or frozen with fear to the point where they uh, broke their own children. And in breaking their own children, they ended up raising uh, the males to be dependent or effeminate and the women to, uh, to be independent or masculine. Um, seeing that women are the ones who are closest to children, uh, in the earlier stages, uh, most likely any type of abuse or uh, molestation would probably occur from a woman, more likely than it would a man, because women have higher access to uh, children. Well, and a caller, not caller if, you, if, you don't, if, if you don't mind, sorry, but um, I was just wondering, great, because great you, point, you did, great well, a, a, claim, a claim was made, so could you perhaps maybe enlighten us on where we could you know, follow up on your claim. Is there a source you can cite for the the claim that females are most likely the perpetrators of molestation at a certain period of uh, life? You know, when you're, uh, uh, you know, so. Well, I mean, if you if you, there's been movies made about this stuff. I mean, for, first of all, the movie right, Ash but, but preferentially, I'm I'm saying if you could maybe just so we can follow up on it because you're saying a lot of things that are certainly interesting to a lot of viewers. Maybe like a, an academic citation you can. Uh, you can supply to substantiate that claim instead of a, a movie if you just had that so that people could follow up on it, people who want to. Um, you know, well, for instance, uh, the, the, we have an example with, with R. Kelly, for instance. He was the perpetrator himself, but it's a known fact R. Kelly was, uh, he was sexually abused by his sister, by a woman. Um, and there's a lot of other instances. I mean, there's literature on this. I can get that to you later. I don't want to stop and be trying to prove stuff and, you know, all this different literature. A person can do their own research into some of these things. But women, it's logical to approve, to assume, to know, it's a known fact that women have higher access to children, especially children with, who aren't even with clothes on. So the chances are it's most likely had been a woman that has perpetuated this stuff because they have more access to the children and they have more access to the children when the children are not properly clo or completely clothed. So if there's any inappropriate and would, contact... It, and that would, assume, that would assume that the spirit of lust could affect a woman in the same way that it could affect a man. Well, I mean, okay, the, spirit okay. of lust came over, okay. the spirit of lust came over Eve. As far as Adam and Eve, the spirit of lust is one that came over the woman first. Okay. It Thank you so very wasn't... much. We're, we're, our time is uh, getting away from us. I do Thank you very much, okay. caller. I uh, want to get back to uh, Mrs. Uh, Waller. Yes. Well, I, you yes. know, I just want to address two things uh, in, in, in what the uh, caller stated. Uh, I think that the, the false narrative is consistently pushed on black women as being angry and the problem. And I think that's false narrative because if we look historic passionate, we need to reframe how we label that. And yes, we are the backbones of so many things. 
and if we just look politically, black women single-handedly saved democracy. So I think we need to really reframe how we think about black women, number one. Number two, I want to address the fact that he wanted to know how he could be uh, more of a support for his daughter, if those are the right words. I'm going to say consistency. Whatever you do, be consistent in her life. When you say you're going to do something, do it. If you cannot do it, you make sure you contact her and let her know that you cannot do it. It is the man who really helps build the trust of a young girl. And when you consistently break that in a woman as a child, you are responsible for building what you have labeled as an angry woman. It is from the man. So we can sit here and, you know, point fingers all different kinds of ways. But how you can be there for your beautiful daughter is to be consistent. Do not lie to her and make sure you value her. How you treat her, you're teaching her how to treat herself. That's what That's I That's powerful. Say. Can, can you say, how would you say that to my 13, I speak to a group of 13 to 18-year-old young men now say that, well, how do they support the young ladies around the country? How do they change the narrative? You know, uh, is it proper to open the door? How do you speak? Can you speak strength to my young men for a minute? As it relates to how they deal with women? Yes, ma'am. Or what do you want me to speak strength to? The, the so same, the same way have, as you So have a 15-year-old and a 20-year-old uh, black king, too, I'm raising And I teach them how to treat women by being an example, number one, and by opening honest dialogue. So I think if we're talking to your 14 to 18-year young man and we're teaching them how to be able to change the generational curse that maybe they came from, we have to open honest dialogue in that power circle and deal with topics that maybe they've not had an opportunity to discuss. And I would encourage them to be honest. There's no judgment in this room. I just need you to speak from your heart. I need you to speak from your gut because that's where the healing starts. And when they start having these honest dialogue and these honest conversations as to what maybe historically they were taught, maybe their dad was angry and said black women are are all these issues and they take that into treating the next young girl. Let's have the conversation and start dispelling those false narratives because that's not true. Your mama raised you. She loved you. She gave you life. And I would take positive images and positive conversations of women and share them with men. I would deal with whatever they may be struggling with around women and start really dealing with it. Let's get to the core issue. Let's tear it down to rebuild it. That's what I would do with your young man. I would also ask him to share positive stories about women as well as just not negative ones, because if we can look into the positive, we can find strength. We can find hope. And if we can find hope in whatever they're dealing with as it relates to women, then we can revolutionize the relationships of men and women together. Beautiful. Dr. Cannon. Yes. Um, I, I know you didn't ask, and I don't want to button here too much because um, I know it, it, I, I really like it to be a conversation centered on the guest. But um, if I was to offer some advice to you on what to tell these men in relation to, yes. you know, um, coexisting in a world with women, because obviously we're two sides of one population. We both need each other literally for survival. I would say to tell them that, as many other people have said, hurt people hurt people. Meaning, even if you're dealing with someone, let's say a woman who, um, you know, maybe exemplifies all of those stereotypical traits that Miss Waller spoke about in relation to, you know, the, the angry black woman stereotype. Even if that's the case, I would tell them that hurt people hurt people and that if someone is lashing out, that's even more of an indication for the importance of teaching empowerment, specifically to girls, because girls that are more empowered grow up to be women that are more able to, you know, deal with their pain and deal with their trauma, um, you know, in a transformative way. So, you know, really, if you're, if you're a male and you're, you're coming into contact with a woman who is, you know, unsatisfied and making that known somehow, the, the best thing you can do really is just empower and support even more because the more supported and more empowered a woman feels, the better able they're going to, the more able they're going to be with, uh, 
dealing with that in a more constructive way instead of lashing out, because that usually is a symptom of a lack of uh, empowerment that was instilled in a, in a young lady when she was young, if they're lashing out in the way that, you know, you're talking about where you, you spoke about, and the caller did too, I think one of the guests, women putting them down or women, um, you know, berating them. That's usually a sign that they weren't empowered when they were younger. So empowerment and, um, you know, teaching them to, to find strength within themselves, not needing someone outside of themselves to make it through a tough situation, but still, um, you know, uh, developing relationships with other people outside of themselves to support, um, you know, themselves that, that aids with most of that, you know, and, and I appreciate that, you know, in a lot of, in a lot of arenas, you know, and I've seen it, you know, from a young person to uh, elderly people, I've seen it from uneducated to educated that sometimes, you know, when a, a black woman is taught all the way back to slavery, and Mike, if you could speak on that, um, on this for a second, when a black woman has been taught from slavery that she can't rely and trust on the black man, the buck breaking process of however that process is real, whatever happened to us men, I, I respected women coming up in my life, younger and older, that knew how to handle me when I made an error. They, did, they didn't go off and get a little education and then look down at all the brothers with a snobby nose. You know, you know in the pageants, when they come back from the, the Miss Universe, Miss Teen Universe, there is a self-esteem building that's needed. But if if you look around and in the family, your brother is being treated disrespectfully even more so. I would like to see the strength of the women say, listen, get your foot off the neck of the black man so that he could be the black man. So in, in speaking to this scenario, and this is what I – both sides, Mike um, – the, the the process of denigrating the black man before the black woman, that process, if the black woman buys into that and she begins to deal that way, well, yeah, we just need to date outside your race. Ain't no good black man with syndrome. I'm just saying uh, we build the women up. We build our sisters up. And and I and my sister, I appreciate you because when you share that you've got sons, that that changed this whole dynamic. I didn't know which way you was coming. You know, a lot of times when people say she women, then they denigrating the man. I've got five sons, and Dr. Lee, I wanted to speak to the fact where you were saying and get clarity that do you think it's proper for a woman, a married woman, to be able to have a birth control method set up? irregardless to what her husband wants? Should she be able to have an abortion if she's married and her husband says no, absolutely not? Well, you know, only one person in that relationship at the end of the day actually, you know, carries a, a baby to term. So that's kind of really personal to the individual who actually, actually has to push out another person. Yes. I appreciate you. Uh, yeah. I'm doing a lot out there. I appreciate y'all, uh, Dr. Lee. Everybody yeah. Appreciate you. Yeah. Yeah. Personally, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this personal personally to that uh, to that uh, question. That was it, 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 it's a very sensitive topic, and I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. talk about my own family. Uh, my mother for eleven children. And my mother was sick, and I was ten years old. And I can, my mother had uh, a, and and I remember, you know, I didn't understand it back then, but my mother had what was termed, and I know the older people would know this, uh, and medical people would know this, what was called a blue baby. And the yeah. back then, that that was a heart some a heart failure a heart condition. My mother had heart failure. At the same time, my mother was hospitalized for um, six months. My dad was a very hard worker. He had to work and take care of the family. I had to stay at home uh, from school some days to take care of the baby after the baby came home. And without my mom, 
Uh, and I recall before this, before my brother was born, that uh, there had been conversation about my mom not having any more children. And and I recall conversations about that um, if the, the both husband and wife, you know, would, would need to sign or agree to birth control. Now, so my my dad and and and, and I knew I know it wasn't intentionally to hurt her or anything, but out of a lack of knowledge. See, the the word says that our people perish for the lack of knowledge. And so um out of a lack of knowledge and what other men, uncles, grandpa, and others were saying to my dad, you know, no, you don't sign, you don't do this, you know. But at the same time, my mother was sick, and she needed birth control. She needed some type of real medical care for her for her own well being, and so. In answer to your question, yes, absolutely yes. We should have control over our bodies, uh, whether we're, you know, whatever the husband says, because it's, at the end of the day, it's our bodies that's going to pain and hurt and go through heart failure, as my mom did. Unfortunately, we lost our brother. But my mom lived on for many, many, many years afterwards. But, um, yes, it's important that we you as know, interesting, women. Interestingly Pardon enough, and, and interestingly enough, other customs, and maybe that's the reason why, Dr. Lee, other customs allow their husband to have more wives. And, you know, we don't do that here, and I'm not for it. But, I, I mean, if I, I wouldn't say to a woman, I wouldn't say to the man, stop having sex with your wife. You got 11 kids. You can't have sex no more because that ain't fair that to him. That wasn't what was said. That, that, that wasn't might, what was said. They said she didn't need and she didn't need to have any more children. They say she so couldn't have sex. Why in other countries, they let their husbands have other wives because they cannot. They, they just. Keep, I still love you. I still want to be a part of the family. I. But I can't keep having these babies for you. That's another you know, discussion. <laughs> That's, that is another another talk discussion. Show. <laughs> That's another talk show. I appreciate it. Because you don't want me to get started on that one. <laughs> okay, we're we're um, down to our last final moments. And while Dr. Candy, you're speaking, why don't you go ahead with your final thoughts and uh, and comments? You so much appreciate it, and you know that. I then uh, Michael. I don't know if Dr. Tatum is here, um, but then but Dr. Cannon, then Michael, and then back to our guest. Beautiful. Beautiful. I just wanted to say this is this is the type of conversation that we need, y'all. And believe it or not, you know, the Bible says that our young people will lead us. You know, people like Michael, you know, in their 20s. Can you believe it? Wish I was 20 again. <laughs> if I was 20 again right now, come on now, 20 right now. And know what we know now, right? And know what we know and got the opportunities. Michael got you. No, our young I know, people right? will lead us, y'all. So we- yeah, we set these conversations up for them to have, to grow, to stay in there with them, you know, and we all grow together. They be, they become the eyes. I appreciate it, young lady. I appreciate what you're doing with the women. Like I said, I've got three sisters, a mama. I love my sisters, my family. I love empowering women. Anything that we can do to help, we there over in that. Thank you so much. Uh, Michael? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, firstly, let me just say that uh, this discussion has obviously been a very spirited one and an informative one as well. Um, you know, I, I certainly hope that Miss Waller would have enough time to speak her mind. And, um, you know, uh, wish we had a little more time for her to be able to do that. Hopefully we can have more conversations like this in the future. But 
still appreciate Miss Waller for coming onto the show and sharing you know, everything she's doing to empower young girls and women and, uh, you know, speaking her mind and, you know, having the courage to do so, obviously, as, as a woman and particularly a black woman. So I, I appreciate that. And, you know, of course, I couldn't go without, you know, giving thanks to, to Dr. Lee, the, the woman, actually, the black woman specifically actually responsible for this platform for, you know, us to be able to do this. So um, special big thanks to Dr. Lee as well for allowing us to come here and have these types of dialogues that Mr. Cannon was right in pointing out we should have these type of dialogues we should have more often. Um, I also want to thank everyone listening for making the show possible as well. Your continued patronage with your listening and, uh, you know, if you're supporting the show some other way, maybe financially, I just appreciate, appreciate you doing that. I'm sure everyone else on the panel does as well. Um, yeah. And I hope we can have many more of these type of very spirited, fruitful discussions and dialogues in the future. Thank you so much, Michael, and I do appreciate you all. appreciate the, my uh, co-hosts, and I love you very much, all of you, and uh, listeners and our callers. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to, we didn't get to all of our callers, and uh, we try. We really do try. And so just keep keep coming and keep calling and keep tapping that, keep tapping one on your phone, and you will definitely be live uh, at some point, and we appreciate you so much. I want uh, you, Miss Waller, I, I thank you for coming, and it has been just so informative. I, I love your spirit and what the work you're doing. I want to congratulate you in all of your successes, and I look forward to learning a lot more from you about your work and uh and how we can work together. Uh, if there's anything I can do, feel free to give me a phone call and just to call away. But I do want you to, uh, as Michael just said, take your time, express your feelings, express your thoughts, and, and say everything that you'd like to say in your, um, you know, in your closing. Dr. Lee, thank you so much again for the opportunity, and we will definitely continue the conversation with Dr. Cannon, Dr. Tatum, and Michael. What a bright young man. I want to take you everywhere with me. I love how you sum up thoughts. It's just brilliant um, and crystal clear, so I love that. Um, just really, I'm honored to do the work, to be trusted in this space, uh, to work with girls in a very vulnerable uh, space, to be trusted not only by them but by their parents. I don't take this work lightly. It's definitely God's work. Um, I intend to do my part to build leaders along with the 12 mentors that work with me. Uh, Some have their master's, some have their PhD, just a brilliant group of women who understand the importance of building our young girls uh, with confidence um, so that when life try and break them, it, it would just bend, but they will not break. They will bounce back and be resilient and comfortable in their skin enough to you can't really say much to them and that they will not just accept disrespect from society as well as from a man. I love men. I think they're critically important, but I do have boundaries that I will not allow them to cross, and we're teaching young girls the same thing. Um, in order to be authentically who God has designed you to be, we want women, who, uh, women and young girls who may hear this show to never doubt that you are valuable, powerful, and deserving of every chance and opportunity in the world to pursue and achieve your dreams and that you belong in all the spaces where decisions are being made about your life. Go forward boldly. Go forward unapologetically and own all your she power without apology. I thank you for this opportunity. And thank you again. Uh, we we definitely be getting together again. Uh, thank you, our listening audience, and and just everybody. I want you to continue to stay safe because our lives do matter. Uh, I I I'm a, a somewhat of a believer in 
in, I'm, I, in the Black Lives Matter movement. There are some things that I don't totally agree with. Um, there's some background information that, um, I mean, but but they're doing it. They're doing their job. They're doing what they, they, they like doing. And next we're going to go out on is called Black Lives Matter. And it's because black lives do matter. And this is a special song written by a family member and whom I'm very proud of. And so uh, with that, I want to say remember our show tomorrow at 3. Join us live. I love you all. This is Dr. Mary Lee Live. I appreciate you. Stay safe and well. God bless you all. One more it? time. Say that one more time. <laughs> do it again. Let's see if I can do DJ, it again. DJ, play that one more time. <laughs> okay, I'm going to try. You know, we, let's get it, we put a 400-year album together. 
together. I don't know. You know, I don't know what I'm doing. You're doing great, sweetie. <laughs> Come on, y'all. We family now. We can do it together. Yes, we can. We we are. If you got music, send it in. We're gonna put it together in this compilation. Four hundred okay. years of music. All right. Send it in to Dr. Mary. Send the music in. <laughs> the day is coming, y'all. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Black to be a change. The black man. Black to the sky, black pride. Give me side, but only on the black side. Maya Angelou kind of vibe. Phenomenal woman, but still I ride. Hokey, pokey, tabber, cadaver. This that black girl magic. I'm a queen, not a savage. Never tell a lie. Come on, come on, come on. They say they love us and that black lives matter. They love our culture and how we put it together. It's time we stop the violence and unite as one. I pray to God that we overcome. All right, Jay. We'll talk. We need to have them on the show tomorrow. <laughs> we can work that one out too. Bless All God, right. y'all. It's been incredible. Let's let's pray. Father, we appreciate this powerful show tonight. Just bless all of our listeners. Bless our efforts, God. Help us walk in unity. Bring that spirit of love through us that it oozes out of us, Master. We need you desperately. We appreciate you. Amen. Amen. All right, then. Good night. Good night.